covering data science and healthcare. But our first speaker, Mike Evans, Hi. he's actually not a data scientist. Right? So this is refreshing. Um, That's somebody, good. Somebody who studied film, actually. Uh, and so how on earth does somebody who is a film major wind up in a world full of data scientists? So I'm sure we'd love to hear that story. Um, and so Mike Evans is a data visualization uh, advocate, evangelist, speaker, expert, who currently works uh, at New Relic. Um, you've heard of them. Uh, and before that, spend some time at, at Facebook. So, uh, so welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you uh, again to Greg for inviting me here. Super excited to be here. I'm excited about all your questions. I like the lead up, you know, how did somebody who started in film get into data? I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out myself, uh, to be honest. Uh, but my, my talk here is called, The Numbers Can't Speak for Themselves. Um, so who am I? Uh, what do I do? My name is Mike Evans. As Greg mentioned, I work at uh, New Relic, which is in uh, San Francisco. Um, I am a principal product manager uh, in data analytics and visualization there. Uh, I've been with the company a little less than a year. Prior to that, I worked at Facebook and some other companies. Um, I spoke for Facebook at the Tableau Data Conference um, in Las Vegas in 2015, and we talked about um, how data guides the engineering onboarding culture. So I've done some fun stuff. Um, this here is a cool piece of art my wife had made. Uh, it's in my office. And I don't know if you can read it too well. Um, it's a quote from a Nate Silver book. Um, it says, the numbers have no way of speaking for themselves. We speak for them. And it's kind of cheesy, right? But I, I really feel like this is true. And I feel like this is the mission that I have at different companies, is to speak for the numbers. Uh, and so we're going to get into a lot of that. Um, but before I do, one of the things um, when I was at Facebook that really struck me was uh, Sheryl Sandberg. She pushed us all that we were not just work people when we were at work, and then real people when we were outside of work. And so I'm going to show a little bit of the personal side of me. Um, this is my family. This is my wife and my two kids. And this past Friday, we actually celebrated a big milestone. We became uh, debt free for the first time. Um, so it's been. <laughs> It feels good. Like I feel extra. Like hey, they fly. Uh, and if anybody, come back in 30 years. <laughs> it's a long road. Um, if anybody's interested in that, uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Would would love to tell you about our journey and our and our stuff. Well, let's get into it. Okay, data. Apparently, you guys have had a lot of data scientists that come in and talk. So I'm, I would start to wonder. You know, is there anything that data can't do? And I think the best visual I found was this one of that kind of hope, right? Is data the new god, right? Um, but then there's also despair, right? When data lets us down. We look at the last presidential election. Forbes has it here, um, the science of error, how polling botched the 2016 election. So there's a lot to cover in data, a lot of exciting topics. You know, we could talk about machine learning. We could talk about all these different algorithms. But I thought, let's talk about this. I'll let you read it. Right. So we're going to talk about data visualization, right? The visualization of data, taking data and turning it into something that you can understand. Um, quick question. I don't have the notes. Sure. I had a, when I interviewed at Facebook, I actually brought two laptops in case they were going to ask anything. Um, <laughs> so this, this stuff happens all the time. And in fact, when I did interview, um, they, they do this, uh, this section where they test you on your skills. And uh, part of it was on Tableau. And they, it was just when they had come out uh, with Tableau for Mac. And I hadn't used it at all. I didn't have a Mac at the time. And so here I am, like, totally used to Windows. And that was my hands-on course. You know, and I, I, I was surprised that I got the job after that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here we go. So all right. All this for the Dilbert cartoon, right? I hope my notes were really good. Um, OK, so we're going to talk about data visualization. Um, charts and graphs, all that presentation stuff. 
So why do we care, right? Why do we care about any of this stuff? I mean, AI is so much better. It's more exciting. More people talk about it. Like machine learning is a big deal. Uh, who cares about charts and graphs? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, the people leading your business need to make decisions. You know, and until you can have AI replace them, you need to inform them uh, so that they can make the right decisions. Um, so real quick. Um, I thought maybe you could have a thought experiment. When you're thinking about understanding something for the first time, how do you explain it to people? Right? You don't have to shout it out, but when I normally it's like, oh, I see, you know, I get it. Or, 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 or you know, why don't you picture this? Everything is through our eyes. It's all visual, right? It's it's our primary sense. It's what drives us. And you may be surprised to know that charts didn't really appear until the late 1700s. Um, and the first, and there's a little bit of debate. Some people say in the 14th century, there are a couple things that kind of look like charts. But, but for the most part, uh, this is what we got. So the first timeline chart, and I'm going to show you these two, uh, was Joseph Priestley. And then William Playfair came up with the first bar chart and pie chart. So here's our first timeline here. It's pretty neat. You know, We've got all these different thinkers over time. Uh, Really nice font in there. I like that a lot. Um, and then here's the first bar chart, um, which at the time actually didn't catch on. People thought this was pretty childish. And uh, it, it wasn't until much later that, that you really saw charts and graphs in general use. And God help us, here's the pie chart uh, that, that shows up at 1801. If you spend any time with uh, data viz nerds, they go crazy for the, and I did too. It's like when you first convert to something, you know, and you're on fire, they'll tell you pie charts are the absolute worst. You should never use them. There's no value. It's still basically true, uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. But they're so ubiquitous at this point that the minute that you start beating somebody over the head on this stuff, they're just going to tune you out. So pie charts are fine. Uh, but not really. So let's fast forward uh, to the 1980s, right? So this is when things really take off as far as charts and graphs because the personal computer comes home and all of a sudden we have these programs like Microsoft Excel. We've got spreadsheets and we can create our own charts. And all of a sudden, something that only a statistician could do before, anybody can do. So that takes us to where we are now. I don't have to tell anybody in this room that data keeps growing exponentially. You've probably seen those charts, right? They just keep going up. Um, I've mentioned anyone, anyone, my kids can create charts and graphs with just a few clicks. But the best practices in visualization, they're not known. They're not known by most people and frankly by most vendors, really, that are giving folks the tools. So if they aren't known to people or the vendors, then they're generally Hard to come up with, right? And so you end up with stuff like this. Um, and this is an older example. This is from 2006. Um, and right around this time is when a fellow by the name of Stephen Few um, started writing some books, uh, some of my favorite stuff. And anybody else think this is like super exciting? I, my wife was joking with me when I went through this. She's like, only you would get super excited about this a book that looks like this. Um, but I do. And uh, what's neat is that he really corralled um, this disparate knowledge. Uh, Tufty was a guy that, that had, I think, was the most famous by that point. There are a couple people here and there. But he really, he was on a mission to make this stuff make sense. He was so frustrated with the <laughs> software that was out there that he couldn't come up with stuff that worked. That he actually did a lot of it in Adobe to show people what should actually be done. And my favorite part of the book is actually not uh, all the content. It's the foreword. And I'm a, I don't know if you can tell, I'm a generally like positive guy. I'm like upbeat. And I'm not really into snark. But this foreword uh, in the book is, is one of the best things I've ever read. So I'm going to share that. He, he says, without a doubt, I owe the greatest debt of gratitude to the many software vendors who have done so much to make this book necessary by failing to address or even contemplate the visual design requirements of dashboards. Their kind disregard for visual design has given me the focus, ignited my passion, and guaranteed my livelihood for years to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you open a book. So um, yeah. 
With all of that coming in, let's see, make sure I'm on the right one. We run into this other camp, though. And I run into this a lot. I work primarily internally. I've worked and I've, I've shipped some uh, external data products. But primarily, I work internally. You know, I'm going to all the different parts of the business, not just my current employer, but at other places that I've been. And I run into this a lot. Even, you know, people that work all day with data, they say, essentially, can't we just let the numbers speak for themselves? Or I hear it said in different ways. You know, I'm not a visual person. Mike, you know, I don't, I don't need that. Um, I don't need anything pretty. Just get me something quick and dirty. I, I've heard that a lot. Or can I just get this in the spreadsheet? Like, how can I just download this thing uh, right here? And I think it all comes from these common myths that some people just aren't visual learners. So they don't need uh, charts and graphs. Or even further, that data viz is like a dumbed down version of actual numbers, right? Like if you're really not that smart, then maybe you know, we'll make it in a graph so you can get it, right? Like some of those infographics you'd see in a magazine, maybe that's what it's all for. Is this resonating with anyone yet? Anyone want to admit that they're on this side? It's OK. Like we can still be friends. Nobody yet? OK. All right. So let's do a quick exercise. And this is the kind of thing that I would do. Normally, it's finance. I'm not picking on finance, but normally, those are the folks who are the most like drag their, 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 their nails in. They don't want to participate in charts and graphs. So I'd start with something like this. And the question I'd ask you, you know, how many subcategories in the customer segment are um, unprofitable right now? Anybody want to try to count them up? Maybe as fast as you can. Like, yes, it is Justin. Three. Three. Let's see, bookcases, tables, and scissors. Okay, but really, what I want to know is like the combination, like the subcategory with the customer segment. Twelve. Okay, let me let me see if this will help. <laughs> right, it's a cheat, right? But this is a lot easier, right? And all I did was change the color. Stephen Few said, uh, data visualization, it builds a bridge from data to knowledge. And I'll, I'll reference that a lot. I'll say sometimes data to understanding. Uh, it basically gets you from the raw numbers into a place where you can actually do something about the data. So one more. And tables aren't bad, right? Like tables are part of data visualization. In fact, if you needed to know like the specific number like the dollar value of international sales for March, this would be perfect for you because you could just look it up. It's like a catalog. That's what tables are, are really good for. But if you wanted to see maybe something you were looking for and hey, there's this dip in international sales in August that we can't explain, uh, this would really be your better bet. And it's the same data uh, that we had before. All right. So moving along, how does anyone know what we should do for data viz anyway, right? Like where does this come from? Um, I'd say it comes from uh, this law of simplicity. Sometimes you hear Gestalt principles. Any design nerds among us in the MBAs? Yes. Yeah. Just, OK, cool. So it all comes from what's really neat, why I get so excited, and how I think this ties into film and, and into storytelling is that we all just try to make sense out of chaos, right? And, and we see different structures, and we just try to make sense. You know, if you talk to anybody that's been through a hard time, you know, two years later, they'll tell you, you know, it all kind of worked out or, or something along that, right? They, they've got to take events, and they've got to make a story. They have to make sense of it. And visually, it falls into a lot of these here. Um, for example, uh, in the proximity, just about every one of us is seeing this as three rows of four dots, right? Just because of the spacing involved here. And, and, and so on. I'm not going to go into each uh, individual one. But these are it, what I like to talk about. I like to explain. It's like the flow the, of how our perception works. And you can either work with it or you can work against it. And so what DataViz does, it works. It tries. When it does really well, it works with it. So that's what we're going to try to do. All right. I've mentioned one book. This is another one that I really love. I highly recommend you check this out. I even bought a bunch of these at work. 
And I started lending them out. I had my own little lending library. And so analysts and managers, I even got some VPs in sales, true story, to read this. Uh, and, and they even gave it back too. Uh, but it's by Cole uh, Nussbaumer, Netflix. And what's neat about this, she doesn't go as deep as Stephen Few, but it's this quick on-ramp for people that are in business, that are around data, that need to express things quickly. Uh, and she does a wonderful job. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through an actual example, unless anyone has questions. I was told that you guys love to ask questions. I haven't heard any yet. Perhaps I'm just too loud. No, we're good? I'm going to walk you through a step-by-step -step example, OK? All right, this was from her blog. This is an actual chart that did exist. I don't think she made it up. Um, if you're really interested in finding stuff that looks like this, I think it's viz.wtf, something like that. Like people, people that are in this, they like to find bad things. Um, before we get into changing everything, anyone want to share thoughts of what isn't working? You can pretty much point to anything. <laughs> yes, Jason. I don't like the grid lines. Don't like the grid lines. OK, cool. Christy. The units on the x and y axis are all off. On the bottom, at least, on the x axis, and then you don't need as many numbers on the y. OK, there's just more. It's a little overwhelming, right? Anybody else want to? Yes? The color is going to be similar. OK, yeah, especially on this projector. It's, it's, uh, it's supposed to be blue and pink, right, the, the typical gender colors. Maybe not the best choice, uh, but you're right. On here, it's, it definitely it kind of bleeds together. I don't, like, I don't like the uneven spacing yeah. of time on the x-axis. Mm. Very, yeah, I like that as well. So let's walk through how we can make this better step by step. A lot of times you just see before and after, and it's hard to pick up every little thing. So let's go, and we're going to have it in the, in the top. So we mentioned grid lines. Let's remove the vertical ones first, and I'm going to go back and forth like, why does any of this matter? But if we're going back to the 80s, I mentioned this guy. Uh, I always say Tufty. Is that how you say it? I'll say Tufty. Uh, he came up with this concept of ink on a page, because everything was printed in newspapers. Um, and so the amount of ink that was on the page, if it wasn't part of the data, then they had this really clever name. It was called non-data ink. Right? And so what you wanted to do was you wanted to remove as much of the non-data ink as you could. And you knew you were done when you couldn't remove anything else and still have the key message. So that's essentially what we're doing. So let's remove that one. And what the heck, let's remove another one. Right away, this is better. right? It's not distracting from the main point. It's still not good, uh, but those were good steps. Next thing, um, I don't know. like. I never do. Do you guys see 3D stuff much? Anyway, is everyone over this? OK, good. Just don't do it. Don't do 3D. Um, and then remove this bevel effect. I swear I used to do this all the time. When I started, uh, and I was doing Excel at everything, I would just throw this up, and I'd like tilt it. And like, there were like stars in the background. Um, you know, I was, I was on fire. But it's, it's actually bad. It's distracting. Don't do that. Um, so removing the color effect. Now it's looking flat, more modern. Um, this one scares some people. Um, I know somebody called it out. This axis here, why, why isn't this needed? Because you wouldn't always remove this axis. Yes, Sally. It's redundant because you, you have them. You can see the differences, but also because you have a percentage. Yeah, it's labeled right there, right? So you don't need both. It's like pick one, right? If you're not going to have it right there, then the axis is fine. Uh, but we drop that. Some people get scared when we start doing stuff like that. OK, so we're dropping that. Um, next thing, this is a subtle thing. And this is not intuitive. And a lot of this, as we go through, it'll feel like, oh, yeah, definitely you should do that. But a lot of this data viz stuff, it's not intuitive. But the good news is, is that it's pretty simple once you learn the rules. But you have to like learn them on purpose, and then you can use them. So this one, when you put it lower, the advantage here is that your eyes aren't bouncing, right? Because you want to see the, the edge of the, line, the, of the bar um, without having to go up and down, up and down. You see that with legends as well. I'm getting in the, a little in the weeds. I'll, I'll try to speed this up a little. Um, make the x-axis text horizontal. Was this bugging anybody? This here? Right, OK. Don't do that. Um, and then, the, yes? You know, with uh, like uh, moving this uh, number uh, lower. Yes. Is it still visible? 
I mean, you're, you're also wearing glasses, so. Oh, yeah, uh, on the projector, yeah, I'll, I'll admit it's a little uh, fuzzy. Um, if we didn't later do anything to the font, I would say you're onto something. If that was like we stopped here, not necessarily the greatest move, right? Because now you have this black on purple, probably not the best contrast. So would you like, uh, like switch it to white? Yes, we're getting there. <laughs> you're ahead of me. But you're right. This alone, you could argue that step alone wasn't enough. Maybe she did it out of order. Maybe she, she should have done it a little later. Because when we're at this intermediary stage, uh, it is a little muddy. That's, that's a good point. Good, cool. Um, let's see, then we're making the x-axis horizontal. This is a subtle thing. Um, removing these tick marks. A lot of this stuff gets missed. I mean, nobody ever focuses on this, but it does distract. Uh, you don't need this line. Because we have the spacing, getting back to the dis, uh, Gestalt principles, the spacing implies that they're separate. You don't need a tick mark uh, right there. And then finally, hooray, we're changing uh, the awful font. Don't play with fonts. If you're, you know, if you're presenting something to, to a C-level executive at your company, like, just, just be simple. You know, just pick one font. It's OK. Nobody, you know, nobody knows. And then while we're at it, um, let's decrease the legend size. Um, out of the box, a lot of time, the font is all the same, all the same size. But the legend shouldn't, isn't the point of emphasis uh, in this visualization. You guys feel like this better so far? Is it good? I think a lot of times this is where we stop, but there's a glaring thing I think is next. Yes. The level of precision. Level of precision. I can't tell you how many times I see like internal reporting especially, but even external stuff, where they're giving, you know, 15.8%. Why do we care about that? Right? Like round it up. Um, and then here is where, here is where we, we change it to white. To, to make a better contrast. So we're getting really, really good. We rounded it up. We made it white. And then more important than a lot of this little stuff, we're changing. You know, there was a grammatical error up at the top. But even more than that, we're making the main point the main point. We say more women start their holiday shopping early. Yes? Would you see, would you see value doing a cumulative chart for this? Right, because you're kind of moving across time. like. like Okay, so what, what, would, what would that be in the decision making process? Like why, why bucket like this versus like a cumulative, like as of September, as of October, you're this much through to your total 100% customer penetration of last two weeks? I like where you're going. That, that would be fun. I don't have that in the deck. Uh, but yeah, it, it depends what your overall goal is. I think for this example, this is something, you know, this would probably live in an art, some, next to an article, right? Like this is probably following some lightweight journalism. Uh, but if you actually wanted an analysis and like sort of, hey, how far are we into it? And then, and then catching up. Yeah, I'd like that. I, I'd want to make that. I'd want to collaborate with you on that. That's good. Anybody else? Yes? So like the simplicity of this chart feels like very in vogue right now. Like think about Google's, um, their logo, like how simple it's gone. Right. How coloring has gone. Do you see like at any point this going back to a point where it's like more like beveled and yeah, like chart bling coming back. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm surprised all the time, quite frankly. Uh, I hope not. I hope not. I, I, that, that, that's encouraging that you find that, that other stuff, you know, you don't run into it anymore. I, I'm kind of in a bubble, so I was, I was looking for that. Um, nobody else sees that stuff a lot. Nobody wants to admit it. Yes? Given you add the unit on top, would you not remove the 12 percentage signs in the bars? they're not necessary. Right. I like that. Uh, I don't remember if she does that or not. Uh, let's see. What's the next one? Uh, the next one is color. Um, so let me get back to that. I'll get back to that. I'll, I'll double check where we end up. Um, here she makes a decision. Um, so now she's going with pink and gray. Gray is your friend. Uh, when, especially if you just have two or three colors, pick a color that you want for the emphasis. And then make everything else mute, right? Like if, you're, if you have one main thing, if women is the focus of this chart, make women the focus, right? You don't need two competing saturated colors. Make one beige or gray or something. Those are your friends. It makes the other uh, stuff pop. Um, that's what we do here. No, um, and I think your point is fair. Um, in the next example, uh, we do something like what you're talking about. 
But essentially, this is where we end up. Um, to your point, Greg, we don't get rid of this kind of choppiness in the time structure, uh, where we have you know September, October, November, and then you know these couple weeks, right? So it's not straight away, but uh, overall, pretty nice change, and we walked through exactly how that went. Feeling good? You guys want another one? Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, back to Stephen Few. So this is an example from him. So I'm going to walk through what he has, and then I'm going to put a few things that I would do to make it a little better, um, and we'll see what we all think. So <laughs> this is the one that he came up with. I think he's cheating. Does anyone see stuff like this? No, he's cheating. OK, so let's just skip ahead. Um, to me, this is where I see stuff. Uh, let me make sure my notes over here. Is this fair? You guys see stuff like this? And in my experience, most people would say, ship it. You know, that's good, right? I mean, I've got my actual, I can figure it out. I got my budget. It's the expenses. What's the next thing I need to do, right? We're just the report factory here. This is what we do. Let's just ship it, right? So think about that. If in your heart of hearts you're thinking, Mike, I kind of think you're full of crap. Uh, this does seem OK. Let's come back uh, to this uh, with where we end up. Because this, I think, is more dynamic than even the first example. We're going to go someplace maybe unexpected. All right, so we're pointing out the tick marks here. We're going to get rid of those. Um, and this level of precision, we don't need the sense, right? Like, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so we're going to update that. Uh, let me make sure I don't miss anything. Moved. Cool. Um, you mentioned this before. You know, the percentage was redundant. Here in the legend, now we're saying, hey, this is US currency. I don't need to have a dollar sign on each one. Quick tip. If, you, if somebody's giving you or you are giving somebody else something where they go like this to read it, <laughs> you are doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. People don't believe me. Uh, yeah, if, you ever, if you're ever craning your neck. Even if you're reading on your phone, it's, it's easy just to move the phone. Yeah, I guess. I, th again, yeah, I'm an expert in my own opinion. Uh, but uh, this here, th that's not right. So a, a lot of software will let you move this. And I would recommend that you do. Again, because you're trying to stay in the flow, right? We want to we wanna go downstream with all of the stuff, uh, the way that our, that our brain works. We don't want to bounce around and, and find stuff out. Um, to that end, let's move the legend up at the top. Uh, this is something I don't see many people do, uh, w which is a nice, uh, a nice helpful thing for, for your readers. Again, the whole point is you want somebody to get the point right away. This isn't, hey, what a wonderful chart you made. You know, even though I like that when people say that. Uh, but it's about, hey, can I get to the point as soon as possible? Um, so that helps them. Again, gray is your friend. Yes? Yeah, about that. Because um, it seems like maybe if that's the point, like you want to consider what the point of the graph is before you start doing all the fine tuning. Right. Because you might just want to restructure the entire graph, it would seem like. I love what you're saying. I'm going to touch on that at the end. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a framework to do just that that I have found helpful. Um, so come back. Let me know if you like that, uh, if, if it works or if you want to discuss more. How am I on time? I'm good, right? OK. All right, so we're rolling along. Gray is our friend. So now we're comparing actual to the budget. Um, it's good. Now we're doing some crazy stuff, all right? So instead of two bars right next to each other, we've got this gray line, OK? Everyone's still with us, right? Um, so it's either on top of the actual or it's above, right? Because we're still, it's still the same value. I didn't change the values. I'm just now putting them together. This on its own, I don't think is that intuitive. If I stopped here, I'd say this is probably better. But we're going someplace. Someplace scary. Oh my gosh. We're at a line chart now. Um, again, it's the exact same values, uh, but we don't necessarily need a bar. What we're really doing, to your point, what are we actually doing? What's the point of this expenses chart, right? Uh, and I'll get to that too, about how to have good headings. We're trying to compare the actual and the budget, right? So line graph is a much better choice here. And because we're not going to be a bar graph anymore, we're going to be a line graph, we don't need to start at zero. Quick aside, if you see a bar graph, and I see these all the time, it doesn't start at zero they are likely misleading you. I saw one, uh, I'm not going to call it out, but uh, I saw one recently. And I even 
like tweeted at them and they, they didn't say anything, which is fine, I guess. Uh, but it's like, you know, you're, 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 you're misleading because visually, if I took, you know, if this was actually 20,000 here, you know, I'm misleading you as what the difference is between each other. But with lines, you don't have to. So boom, here we go. We can look at uh, and magnify what the actual differences are. So we're getting better. We're getting better. But we're not done. We're going to move the legend to the end here. So again, it reduces the eye bounce even more. So now I can see actual and budget. It's right in line. And if you needed to print this out, you know, black and white, this would be a good move to make sure that everyone can tell the difference. And then finally, almost finally, we get to the real point of this. We didn't need two bars. We didn't need two lines all along. We're doing a comparison. Why aren't we just tallying the difference and then putting that on the chart, right? And the title here, it's, it's quite clinical, expense variance from budget, right? I don't know people that talk like that, but he's right. Like, that's what it is here. Um, and then if we want to make it a little better, let's go by percentage. And why would I care about this? If I wanted to compare different departments against each other, then I don't want the dollar value, right? If I'm going to have this and I'm going to compare um, engineering against sales and who's over budget, you know, I want a percentage probably, right? And so if I have this in percentage, now I can lay other ones on top of it uh, and go there. And this is where he stops, uh, which I think is pretty good. Is that a good journey for everyone so far? All right, cool. But I'm the one presenting, so I get to, you know, put put a couple things that I think would make it even better. Let's see what you guys think, what you all think. Here's my recommendations. Please do this. Uh, everywhere I've, I've you know, seen people do this, I think it works exceptionally well. In the header, ask a question. To your point, like what is the point of this anyway, right? It's not sales by region. It's not expenses. Like, ask a question. And then answer the question in, in the chart below. Ask a question, answer it. Like, it's, it's really easy. Um, and then I'd label the endpoint, and I might even color uh, a danger area in red. So coming back to what this was, here we go. Here's my question. I tend to be pretty casual. If your business is different, uh, you can be less casual. But hey, are we trending over or under budget? Right? This should probably answer it. And then it's harder to see. I would. I would label you know, what, what the answer is, at least at the end. So we're 7% under. And then for me, this is kind of weird, right? Because we're saying, are we over or under budget? And this is negative. Is negative good? Like normally negative is bad. So I would just try to be a little helpful. And I'd color the top in red to let people know, hey, that's where you don't want to be, right? And then if you're going to the person in charge, like, hey, why are you guys in the red here? You know, it's, like, it's really easy to understand uh, where we're coming from. So. Any thoughts, questions, concerns? This is where I finish, which I think is slightly better. Yes? I mean, the main point, the 7% is really small. So I think, more, like in, in our firm, we would put that in the title. As okay. Well, so hide it in there. Excellent. Right. If the point is, at the end of December, yeah, you could even, and I say ask a question, answer a question. The other thing you can do is just make a statement, right, and support the statement. I think that's just as valid. I like questions, but. Yes. Uh, what's your opinion on combining, you know, such a line with, uh, you know, bar uh, bar charts, so that you can see both axes, because you you don't know from the start the, which uh, angle is more convincing, the percentage or the absolute values, and uh, like if if we ask the question like what was that, like what did we actually overspend in March? Right. We wouldn't be able to say from, from this one, comparing to the initial bar chart. So I'm going to go back to our story about the oysters. Um, I think as you're doing the discovery, as you're doing visual analysis to figure it out, I think that's fine. But as you're presenting this up, I want to limit the amount of data. So I might have, you know, if the top is 9%, I might put 9 there, and then after that, and, and, and stay there. Uh, in general, I'm not sure if this was your question, but I'll answer this anyway. If you have a bar chart and then a line chart together, generally not a good idea. I still see it all over. The, I think Google Analytics still does it out of the box. Um, it's generally confusing. And what's even worse is when you have two axes, even if they're both lines, if they're totally different axes, people, um, I should almost draw it, but once they cross, People assume something just happened, right? 
Like if I put some other just, uh, let's just say, marketing expenses on here, right, on the other axis, OK? And it just went from a million dollars to two million, right? And it's just this other line. Wherever that crosses, the person you're showing that to thinks something just happened. But nothing happened, right? Because they're completely independent. You just throw them up on a graph together. And now they're going to, oh, you know, we got to check out May. What happened? You know, it, it, it interrupts the flow. Yes? Um, both of the examples we just did had a lot of very specific steps. But earlier you mentioned kind of like learning the rules. Right. Are there just sort of high level tips <laughs> or guidelines to, you know, um, be successful in terms of visualizing data? Absolutely. Um, and the two books that I'm referencing have a lot of those. It's more than I can cover in the 45 minutes. If you guys want to talk with me, I, like I could talk about this forever. Um, I probably would. Uh, but in general, yeah, I, I can shoot some stuff at you. Also, you can connect with me. I give you, you know, more resources than you'll know what to do with. But there are best practices. Again, they're not intuitive, but it's not that hard to learn. You just have to decide to do it, and then you have it in your toolkit where most of the other pe your other peers, your other competitors don't. And I think it gives you an advantage. And that's one of the main reasons why I came today is I, I hope that I can equip you with something that others don't have so that you can get out there and win. Yes? Um, a specific point to Luke's question is just, are there tips for when to use what types of graphs, so a bar chart versus a line chart? Right. Um, time series is generally used for line charts. Um, bars are more discrete in nature. So if you wanted to know where something specific was at each point, um, a bar chart can work better. Um, yeah, essentially in your toolkit, you got bars, you got lines. Those are most, most of uh, what you want. Sometimes you'll turn a bar into a dot if you want to not have the, the uh, axis start at 0. And then you can get away with the same chart, just making them dots instead of uh, bars. Uh, but there's, there's also, um, if you Google, there's some pretty good like, idea flows about when to use what. Uh, and I could point those uh, to, to you all as well. Question? A couple questions. So uh, I can't remember exactly what you had before this graph. But um, at the point that you converted it into a line, um, uh, I mean, you have to reference what your uh, actually subtracting what from what, right? Right. Because if not, it could be unclear whether you're doing budget minus actual or actual minus budget. Right. Yeah, you need to be clear. Uh, here he has uh, you know, expense variance from budget. So those are the two uh, things that he's comparing. But you're right. Once you start taking obvious things away, it's on you, if you're the creator, to be clear with what you're, um, what you're presenting. So, Related to that, like, uh, and I want to you know, use another example. Yeah. So I was looking at the left, uh, at the, uh, uh, the figures, I, I thought, well, maybe because it's all thousands, we can just take away, you know, like, uh, and put, like, yeah, uh, numbers in, in thousands, right? Like 6K. And, and, I think you start yeah. becoming more dependent on just one specific piece of information. Uh, like, if somebody doesn't look at, you know, D units, or if somebody doesn't look at the a specific reference for the graph, then you can totally, yeah, like, uh, totally misinterpret. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I, I didn't have enough time to cover that in this talk, but yeah. The, the danger in learning this stuff is you'll know how to lie with this stuff really uh, effectively. Really effectively. I think the more you know how to lie, the more capable you are of detecting lies when you're presented with them. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, I did some training with some sales folks at a company. Uh, they actually gave me an example that they were using that out in talking with customers that had a, like a timeline and then like this break uh, that, that you almost couldn't see. And then it like jumped several years. I mean, it was completely misleading. Uh, and so my, my assignment to them, which I don't think anyone did, was to go and you know, go up to the top and demand that they change this immediately. Because any customer that knows these rules could call them out on it and ask, hey, what are you doing? Come to my place of business and, and misleading me, right? Like, I don't trust your company at all. Yes, yeah, so very good point. Uh, let's see, I'm done at three, right? OK, so rounding the corner, framework. Talked about giving you a framework. So I'm going to borrow from Agile software development. Uh, this is called user stories. It's a, it's a really lightweight way that people get what uh, you know, is often called requirements. I think it works really well in these situations, especially uh, for general re internal reporting. 
uh, it gets you out of what normally happens, which is, hey, I need some reporting. And then you go to this person, OK, what do you need? Right? Well, what do I need? The obvious answer is everything. everything. Give me everything. Yeah, OK. And so the engineer comes over here, and you come back, and then you have like this 50 column or 50,000 column uh, database, and then you can get anything you want, right? But if you just use this, you know, this simple format, you can start to build little user stories and figure out what it actually is that you want. So here's a quick uh, demonstration. My kids love Star Wars, so if this was an easy one, um, you could say, as a whoever I am, uh, you know, young Jedi, I want to use the Force, which is great. I want to use that as well. Um, so that, and here I can lift my X-Wing out of the swamp. Um, a lot of people stop there. It's like, OK, this is what I want. And if you delivered Luke the Force, right, and it got his X-Wing out of the swamp, but he then couldn't fly away from the planet, then it would get sent back, right? You'd have to go do the rework. So when you're using user stories, don't leave out this acceptance criteria. And what does that actually look like? So here we go. Uh, as a finance manager, right? Hey, I want to view department spending and budgets so that I can compare the spending across the company. And I want to rank the departments by over and under spending, right? Maybe I'm going to go give a report card or something to the CEO or, or something along those lines. If I skip this and then there's no way to rank it, then it's going to go back and I wasn't successful. So um, this, how do you feel about this? Is this helpful? Is this something you can use tomorrow, maybe? Sure. 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 OK. Good answer. Uh, anybody else? Good? Uh, OK, taking a breath. And then I'm going to recap what I said. And I use this one because I didn't cover this type of data viz. And this normally shows up um, in different places. If you subscribe, there's like different Reddits and subreddits on, you know, and people say, oh, data visualization, it's so beautiful, right? Which I think it is. But is this a bridge to understanding, right? Does anyone understand what this is? I don't. And most of the time when I see stuff like this, I mean, it's super cool. I like it. I like the colors. Uh, but it's not telling me anything, right? And I think, I think this is why a lot of people don't take data viz seriously. They see stuff like this, and it's kind of cool, but I don't need that, right? I have a job to do, so um, I'll stay away from that. I'll just work with uh, spreadsheets. Okay, recap. Here we go. Data viz. I hope you'll take this with you. It's not a dumbed down version of data, okay? Um, it's a bridge. It's a bridge from data to understanding. It can include tables and spreadsheets. It's not just charts and graphs, especially if you need to look up something specific. It's best when you follow the law of simplicity, also called the Gestalt principles. You want to go with the flow, um, and it'll work out for you. And when you're doing that, remove, or if you're pressing people that are giving you data, you know, remove as much non-data ink as possible to get to where you want to be. This is my rule. Ask a question in your header. You know, if you're, you know, do this tomorrow. Just put it up there. Ask a question. It'll, so, it'll speed up the process. You'll have a better result. Ask a question. Answer the question. It'll also make you more critical about the chart you just made, right? Because, like we said, anybody can create a chart in like two seconds. Um, then answer the question. And finally, user stories. They're a great framework uh, to use for your team. I recommend you use them. Often, they're real lightweight. You don't need a huge meeting to do it. Just a conversation. Here we go. And we're off. Questions? So I think we were talking earlier about yes. how you know, in the B2C world, when you have customer-facing products, we all know that the user interface is, is critical, right? And right. If you're trying to introduce a new app, and, and it's not intuitive, and it doesn't respond to the user, and the user can't figure it out, then the, they're basically not going to get any kind of penetration in the market. But ever, whenever we're thinking internally, right, when you're trying to sell something internally, for some reason our, our, our concerns about UI and UX and, and, uh, and, and uh, accessibility, you know, they kind of get downplayed. So, so you, your customers are all internal customers. Yeah, right? primarily, yep. But you, you, you view them as customers just as much as, say, a product person would. Absolutely. And when I hear that, I think it's almost like you can be kind to a stranger that you meet today, right? But if you go home to your loved one, you can be a complete jerk and feel okay about it, right? Like, I, to me, it's almost the same, right? If I'm inside a business and I got to give a report for somebody, eh, you know, I guess I'll do whatever. Um, 
Whereas if I have a, a, a customer out there that's going to you know it's going to pay for my product, then I'm going to take it more seriously. So I, that's the analogy I would use. So I you know I would challenge people. Hold yourself to a higher standard. You know, you're you're all working at the company um, together, and if you're running the company, you certainly would hope people would have that. You know, and give you the, that kind of uh, information and, and care into um, you know not misleading you and not just letting the numbers speak for themselves, but helping you understand uh, the data. All right, great, thanks, Mike. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Super fashionable item. You can oh. your wardrobe. Oh, fancy. Oh, hoodies. Yes. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't <laughs> walk right here without a hoodie. Right. I almost wore one. So there yeah. you go. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break and then we come back. We're going to hear from Francis. <laughs>